Distinguished guests, dear friends, I'm really honored to be here with you today, highly reputed academics and officials around me, to discuss about one of the biggest challenges we are facing today. Indeed, the annual State of the Union is one of the most important fora for discussions and consideration of a, of a broader perspective. Again, in this context, common solutions can be more easily identif identified. The phenomenon of migration is not a new one, and we cannot, as was said before me speaking, speak about a refugee crisis. But in the last years, the European Union has become the destination, the destination of increasing flows of people, coming particularly from Africa and Middle East. The Missing Migrants Project by International Organization for Migration documented the deaths of 7,763 people during migration to international destinations in 2016. In a work characterized by high and raising inequalities, the circulation of considerable masses of people may constitute the cause of widespread fears. We have the duty to take care of this fear because it easily turns into hatred. All around the world, we witness the same patterns, leading to the construction of new physical as well as psychological walls. It is a battle of the have notes that can only have the consequence to make everyone and especially the more fragile ones, lonelier and poorer. Solidarity is therefore the most important medicine and the protection of human rights must be at the core of, the, of every action, but is it, it is not enough. Since almost three years, the EU is confronted with a rich and continuous flow of migrants and among them of refugees. Instability plays a huge role here. If we, re if we, re we read uh, carefully the list of countries where most refugees originate, and UNHRC gives, uh, gives us that list, the picture is quite self-explanatory. Not surprisingly, Syria and Afghanistan are at the top of the ranking as they have seen more than six million people living and trying to find safety abroad. Instability on Libya, and speaking about Libya, I could say that is a clear ex example of this lack of coherence among the official agendas of the EU and the unofficial agendas of some of its, of its member states. Instability on Libya, on the other hand, has another consequence. While the country produces a relatively low number of refugees compared to what we would expect given the situation on the ground, its internal instability and the permeability of its borders, borders turn it into perfect transit country for huge flows of people coming from Somalia, Sudan, South, Afri South Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Central African Republic. While migration was already a challenge before, the military intervention and the beginning of the civil war in Syria in 2011 have brought the phenomenon to another level by both creating new refugees and, at the same time, creating new ways to, to, of transit to the, of them, for them. Indeed, the refugee crisis is, at least since, since 2015, among the priorities of the EU agenda, but the reaction put in place has clearly proved to be not enough efficient and not enough effective so far. This has caused a wide and vivid debate on the, in the public opinion, in which messages of solidarity towards refugees and migrants in general get mixed up with the racist reactions. In order to handle this, the contingency in 2015, as it was mentioned even before, the Council adopted two emergency relocations mechanisms to help Greece and Italy to deal with the refugees' emergency, but they have proven to be a failure. There is a clear lack of solidarity and political will to share in equal terms the responsibilities towards those people arriving in Europe, fleeing from, from wars and persecutions, and seeking for, for protection. According to the last available report on the relocation from Italy and Greece, published by the Commission last March, out of the 160,000 people that needed to be relocated, only 14 500 were effect effectively relocated from Greece and 4,400 from Italy. 145,500 people are still waiting for relocation and the emergency, the emergency instrument will expire next September. Indeed, solidarity between member states on the issue appears to be only a formal engagement written in the, treat in the treaties. Apparently, it does not work on the ground. Again, from the very beginning, the, cri the crisis has shown the shortcomings of the common European asylum system and has actually resulted in its collapse. The Commission has reacted by presenting a new package of seven legislative proposals. 
They're, they're, these are aimed at reforming the CEAS by making its provisions more binding for the member states in order to prevent third country nationals to stay illegally on the territory of the EU and prevent secondary movements of as asylum seekers from one member state to the other. However, the proposed revision of the Dublin Regulation has clear shortfalls. It actually draws a system that is even more rigid than before, and it does not allow for any type of flexibility in relation to the country responsible for handling the refugee status applications. By introducing the hotspots approach, where, our, where all illegally arriving migrants are fingerprinted and registered under the supervision of the European authorities and tightening the rules of Dublin regulation, the Commission wants to achieve a twofold goal. Make sure that all illegal migrants are registered upon arrival and make sure that the, third, the countries of first illegal entry are responsible for possible applications for, for international protection. This will de facto transform countries like Italy and Greece into the refugee camps of Europe. Only when the asylum systems on the front of the frontline member states are about to collapse, only then the Commission allows for a corrective allocation mechanism to kick in. Such a mechanism would allow for the relocation of asylum seekers on, in other member states. In order to give an immediate response to citizens afraid by uh, these, those waves, member states concluded last year the well-known and highly controversial agreement or so-called agreements with Turkey we were speaking about before, which furthermore has no legal base and representing, in my honest opinion, a dangerous precedent, both political and juridical. We are basically paying that country to get rid of the problem, but we are surely not contributing to structurally solve it. That all not to, to talk about the fact that the deal with Turkey, which is, now, which is now living a new season of attack to democratic principles, puts aside the, uh, the alleged moral superiority of the Union. This holds both in relation to the championship of protection of fundamental rights and the respect of the democratic procedure for concluding international agreement foreseen by the treaty themselves. Migration has also an external dimension that the Commission wants to strengthen. It, it launched the so-called migration compacts that link development aids to the fulfillment of migration-related indicators, and it concluded readmission agreements with and giving money to countries considered safe, such as, again, Turkey, Afghanistan, the John Wade Forward, and in the near future, Libya. In parallel to, to that, and through the EU development and humanitarian aid policy, the EU has adopted a further emer emergency tool, the so-called Trust Fund for Africa. It aims at taking the deep root causes of irregular migration by pooling funds and stimulating investments in the third countries of origin of migrants. The 55% of world total funds for development already come from the EU, but their effective destinations and their effect efficient use have to be assured. Indeed, the risk is that behind what is said, the tool could turn into a border control and counter-terrorism instrument. Moreover, we are talking of an emergency tool, but the effects thereof are not necessarily sufficient in the long run. To conclude, we need an holistic approach that faces the issues of refugees, but I would say migration, migration in general from all sides. The first necessary condition to achieve a concrete result is our have solidarity, both between member states and inside them. The revision of the Dublin regulation must go in the direction of a real share of responsibility based on a compulsory, preventive, and permanent system of reallocation with the protection of fundamental rights as lighthouse. The attempt to escape this legal, political, and moral commitment cannot be tolerated and should be sanctioned, in my honest opinion, with a freeze of the structural funds. The European Union, with the Brexit ahead, the effects of the economic crisis spreading increasingly around, the recruited sense of terrorism and the refugees crisis, if we want to call that with, a, let's say, the common definition, to tackle is def definitely having hard times. This all risk could further erode the already uh, weak European citizens' support towards the EU and eventually bring to a possible future collapse. In order to prevent it, the EU has to turn this difficult moment into an opportunity. We have to turn the difficult moment into an opportunity to change and finally provide good and viable solutions to citizens' main problems and concerns. Thank you very much.
Um, thank you very much, Fabio. I think we have a fundamental uh, agreement in the panel that certain steps have been made, a lot of efforts have been uh, made, but the challenges are complex and a lot needs to be done, and I really appreciate, Fabio, that you concluded with some proposals and even some strong ones. Um, I would like to invite Eleonora Milazzo, who is an EUI uh, PhD researcher. Uh, we have this front row discussion system this year, so we give a young person for uh, first the floor for questions, then I'll take more questions uh, from... Yeah, thank you very much. Anna, is this on? Can you hear me? So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your pres presentations. Um, you uh, so mentioned uh, that this is actually a, a crisis of political values, and there was a word that was, that, that was a recurring term in your present presentation, and it's very much a buzzword uh, this, these days, and that's um, solid solidarity, which is uh, enshrined in the TFEU, which is really a, a buzzword everywhere we look these days, and it's often in connection, it's often used in connection to the fair sharing of res responsibility. So it's uh, solid, sol solidarity between states, it's sol solidarity towards asylum seekers, but what is not really clear uh, in the de debate and uh, for, for what mat matters in the scholarly literature as well, is what the so, content and the scope of sol solidarity should be. So my so question uh, for you to, today is, well, what uh, you think that the uh, so limits to sol solidarity should be, if any, any limit, any constraints should be put to uh, the so duty of sol solidarity that we, that we talk about. So, um, is there any, any so ground on which solidarity should be constrained, if uh, any ground there should be at all, um, in order to safeguard some other su supposedly com competing values, for, like um, national sol solidarity, for, for example, or security? Um, Again, and this is not only with uh, so reference to the so policy responses at the EU level and at the national level that we just talked about, but it's also with uh, so reference, for, for example, to NGOs and, and volunteers who are di directly involved in um, coping with this um, with the so-called uh, so crisis and whose work has, uh, has, been, has been recently the object of a widespread debate. So I was wondering what your thoughts on this are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Monica Baldi, uh, European and, and national former members uh, of the parliament. And uh, anyhow, I'd like to ask you something because uh, we didn't talk about the priority that uh, the Malta's, uh, Malta priority in this presidency. It's very important because uh, uh, when we speak about refugee, uh, sometimes uh, we talk a lot about Italy, Greece, uh, Cyprus, and we forget uh, Malta. Ma Malta, uh, in this case, I was really impressed because we made a special visit uh, two weeks ago. We went to the European Asylum Support Office, and they are making uh, an impressive job. And so I'd like to ask you, what do you think about? And then uh, even uh, uh, something that uh, Fabio Massimo Castaldo said about uh, the relocation. They're doing an impressive uh, work about that. But first of all, they ask even uh, the support of everybody, even because not only for the state that don't take care of what's going on, but even it's very important, the coordination of intelligence. So this is a, one of the points uh, that we have to discuss too, because uh, sometimes, uh, yes, when we talk about uh, uh, refugee, and it's no more emergency, but it's a governance, um, we have to take care even of the information inside the states. Intelligence like information and uh, to have this coordination and this uh, uh, to share the information about the people because as you know, it's very difficult even to figure out uh, what they are or who are they, okay? Uh, 
And uh, thank you, Monica, for presenting yourself. Please Does state your name and, if you want, your institutional affiliation. It doesn't work. Uh, thank you. My name is Joseph Likari. I am a former Maltese ambassador to Brussels, Paris, Strasbourg, but I speak in my personal capacity. So, migration is a demographic issue. Demography is a matter of numbers. Let me cite just one number. Africa, population, 1.2 billion. How many of them would come to the European Union given an opportunity? How many should the European Union take? How many could it take? If it were to take one out of 20, that would be about 60 million, equivalent to the population of one of our larger member states, namely Italy, France, and so on. So the whole, whole thing is unsustainable. In any case, we already have unemployment of over 9% in the European Union. The pressure for unemployment to increase will go on over the next 10 or 20 years as a result of uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. Our member states will be under pressure to provide employment for all those jobs that will be lost as a result of technological advances. So the European Union cannot take in large numbers of migration. In any case, it, development, it has, never been, uh, it has never been the right solution for development to take place by people moving to jobs. Develop mean, development means jobs moving to people. And that is the objective of the uh, Africa Trust Fund, namely to increase investment in Africa, thanks to uh, the European Union, but especially thanks to Africa's own resources. There is a crisis of values in Africa. Corruption on a huge scale wherever you look. Angola, Zimbabwe, Congo, Ghana, Nigeria, they have all the resources in the world. But all the money goes into the pockets of the rulers and the vast majority of the population remains impoverished with no, no way to escape from poverty. And I say poverty because President Grasso uh, used the word poverty this morning. The only way to escape from poverty is to escape from the continent and to come to Europe. But poverty does not qualify a person under the Refugee Convention of 1951. And that is why that the Refugee Convention is the only uh, way for an uninvited, unwanted person from a third country to enter the European Union, and that is why it is abused on a massive scale. So this is why we should put um, the emphasis I think on I it. I need to give the floor to somebody else as well. We should put the emphasis on Africa overcoming its crisis of values, namely uh, corruption, and other, other measures that have been mentioned, like the agreement with, uh, with Niger and the, and the border tribes in southern Libya, for example, and relocation. Uh, uh, Thank now, you very much. I think my okay. colleagues can elaborate more on this. Just on I relocation. Really just on relocation. Just on relocation. Uh, agreement was reached on 160,000 being relocated. By the end of March, only 30,000 were relocated. In the meantime, in the last three years, half a million arrived in, so in southern Italy. And this year, it will be about another quarter of a million. There is no way relocation can take care of such huge numbers if they are allowed in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a question here. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion and for keeping with the time to the chair and the panelists. Uh, your thank name and um, this is Pina Vasiliu. I'm an alumna from the EUI and currently working in the Council of Europe, uh, head of political department. Um, we had uh, we heard concerns and doubts about the legality of the uh, EU Turkey agreement. My question is beyond legal doubts. To what extent, in practice, developments in Turkey? where a state of emergency is in force since uh, July last year after the failed coup d'etat uh, have influenced the implementation of the agreement, and to what extent the developments may influence it in the future, especially after last month's referendum, uh, which has been highly criticized by international and European observers. Thank you. Yeah. I have, uh, my name is Rainer Bauberg, SBS Department of the European University Institute. I have a slightly provocative question that has been bothering me. Uh, there seems to be broad agreement on the panel that imposed relocation quota is a good policy that is just weakly enforced. Uh, I am in complete agreement that burden sharing is of utmost importance and it does involve relocation. I think reforming Dublin should be on top of the agenda if you want to achieve that goal. But I have some doubts that sending refugees to countries where they don't want to go and that don't want to have them is actually a very clever policy if you think about what has to be done in order to provide maximum level of protection with integration opportunities to the largest numbers of people who need it. Uh, economists have been suggesting for a while that there might be better ways of doing this. And one uh, possible suggestion is tradable refugees, quotas. So instead of cutting on the structural funds, you might say, within that system of relocation, you either take refugees or you finance that other states take the refugees. A direct link between the two things. Uh, and uh, economists have also been saying we should take reference, uh, refugees' preferences into account. Most people agree that you cannot say choose your own destination, but there could be a scheme of matching preferences between countries and refugees on an individual basis that optimizes their chances to get to places where they actually see that they would have integration opportunities. Yes, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Tapio Rantanen, working in the Finnish Embassy in Rome. Uh, I would like to touch upon the uh, policy response and the value aspect of the, this multiple crisis in, in, in the form of the question uh, directed to all of the panelists. Do you think that Europe will be able to guarantee equal rights for the children of those who have arrived in Europe in recent years, if they are born in or on, on their way to Europe or in Europe uh, after their parents' arrival, uh, whether they are uh, given an asylum or undocumented, will they enjoy equal rights with other European children? And uh, how, if, if we have to do something to guarantee that, how will we do it? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll take one last question at the back and then... Well, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I mean, uh, my question, is, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, uh, I mean, Europe has another problem, it's a, a demographic problem. And also, I do agree, as the, the ambassador was saying, is that, uh, okay, the solutions to uh, Africa's problems are internal, but they are also external. And so my, um, my question is uh, that in all the discourses and solutions that we have uh, heard uh, so far, there is no, no saying, uh, nothing said about guest workers uh, uh, as one of the solutions to what is, as you say, a structural problem. Um, uh, from my experience is that uh, uh, there are some, certain number of countries like New Zealand, like Canada, who have actually uh, implemented guest workers uh, 
systems, not from the old kind like we know in the 1970s, but seems to work very well. So uh, do you think about uh, that? Uh, well, very briefly, thank you. Um, I just wanted to recount an article in a Dutch newspaper a few days ago where it was about all the asylum seeker centers that were built in the Netherlands when nobody ever arrived. So there were mayors uh, who were complaining against the central organization in the Netherlands saying, well, we got our populace to accept an asylum seeker center. People have been hired. They now have to be fired because all those refugees who were going to come never arrived. And there you see the mismatch in what's happening in Italy and what's happening in the northern countries. And I think, I mean, a lot of people have asked about the relocation um, policies, but my question would be about the enforcement side of the relocation agreements, however small these are. Thank you very much. I think we have, yeah, a very good set of questions. We'll try to give answers. Fabio goes first. I will try even if I should admit that we, we would need maybe more than an hour normally to discuss about all the items and all the uh, aspects that there were mentioned during your uh, uh, questions. I will start from the first one. You ask what's the limit of the solidarity? It, I think it must be in equal solidarity. So in that case, as you said, we're speaking about the duty. It's a juridical one. It's inside the treaty. We're not speaking just about the moral. If, if the EU is a community also, in a spirit, a community of states, a community of populations, we cannot think that this community could be on demand. And that's what I said, for example, to the Visegrad countries in the past. You are asking solidarity face to Russia for the sanctions. You do not want to provide solidarity face to the migrant crisis. What's, where is the coherence of this approach? And so, once more, I, I'm, I'm advocating in favor of a system in which we will uh, speak about the relocation, not just on a demographical criteria, but also on a, a economical and, and, and uh, uh, one in, in, uh, in considering the possibility also to absorb that uh, offer of work and that offer of uh, being uh, com completely uh, integrated into the society, also from a an, an, uh, work and economical point of view. Uh, about um, about the, the question about the intelligence. Uh, of course, this is also a matter of political will. Let's be frank on that. When we are speaking also about cooperation for, uh, and, and the um, co coordination of intelligence of uh, counterterrorism, we have the instruments and the tools to do that. There are the, the platforms are already in place. Some terrorist, terroristic attacks could have been uh, prevented if all the states would have had the will to share these information. So uh, instead of, uh, as some of my colleagues sometimes uh, uh, said, advocating for new tools and new instruments, the first goal is maybe to spread this culture of cooperation and intelligence. And so also I, uh, I will take as, as mine uh, your uh, um, your request to pay attention also about the situation of Malta, even if I should say that from, from numbers, the number of migrants they are uh, helping and receiving in the, last day, in the last years, it's a bit decreasing if we compare as uh, it was in the past. Maybe because, the, let's say that the main part of these flows is going more from the direction of Italy than uh, uh, to Malta for maybe a kind of a this political decision of how to apply the laws that are now in, in place and the, the political will <clears throat> of the, the Maltan government. Uh, about demographic, uh, the migrations as demographic issues and the pressure for unemployment, it's true. This is a balance that we should consider. And I would like to add to the effect of robotics and artificial intelligence also the effect of the for, so-called forced globalizations and some uh, free trade agreements that sometimes have clear effects even much more wider than what they are explained when we sign up this kind of, of agreement. Nevertheless, uh, we have to tackle this phenomenon because uh, we cannot think really uh, that uh, this is just too big to be uh, solved. 
And as I told you before, we could have different tools. One could be this system, this preventive system before uh, the collapse. But on the other hand, if we are speaking about development and we are speaking about corruption, we should also check very well the way we are investing in uh, our funds for cooperation. One of our proposals was, was, for example, to divide and the funds uh, and the programs in quotas. Show me in which way you are investing the first quota I gave to you for this program. If the quota is really invested and it really is used for the uh, purposes for which it was allocated, so for the development growth, I will give you the second, I will give you the third. It could be a first example. And the second is very important that also all the European governments and the ministers of foreign affairs will stop to play two roles, the official and unofficial one, backing sometimes governments that are clearly corrupted, not efficient, and trying to be really more united, not just in words, but also in practical means. About the legality of the uh, EU-Turkey deal, I was one of the strong opponents since the beginning, because for me it's not even a deal. I'm sorry, but if you are speaking about a deal, there are procedures, and the parliament should have voted with the procedure of consentment. This procedure was not respecting. We never had a vote, and in the narrative also of the EU institutions, when we are asking for a vote and the position of the parliament, this is just a statement. When Erdogan is asking to fulfill what is written in this statement, it becomes a deal because we do not want to disturb too much our Turkish ally that is also a NATO member. Uh, I think that uh, we, in our relationship with Turkey, and this is one, just the last example, we played a lot of hypocrisy in the last years. Since uh, the period in which we said, let's reopen negotiation, but at the same time, Sarkozy was in favor of to create the European for the Mediterranean that was just the space to say, this negotiation will never end. We will have here the new framework, a new forum in which Turkey could stay. It could have been maybe more sincere to say since the beginning that some governments were facing and completely against the possible, the possible enlargement to Turkey and to build up a relationship that will be also current on the European principles. And on this regard, sorry to say, but this referendum, the way it was managed, the result and the concentration of powers in the end of the president nowadays is not at all compatible with uh, the European values and what is democracy. Democracy is just, it's not just to vote every five years. It's a matter of balance of powers inside the democracy, instead of in, in, inside a state, and this is not uh, respected nowadays in, this, in the new uh, st uh, structure of Turkey. I, it's not, there are, those are not my words. I also spoke with Professor Bukikio from the Co Commission of Venice that explained us from a technical constitutional point of view how much it's unbalanced, the new constitution. And uh, uh, last but not the least, because I don't want to answer to all the questions, there are uh, too many, unfortunately. Uh, about reforming Dublin system, we are working on that. We have, a, we have already a proposal, and unfortunately, as I said in, during my speech, this proposal is, may, is maybe going in the wrong way, not in the right one. If we will eliminate criteria and possibilities of flexibility, taking into account also the, familia, uh, the, the family state and the other criteria that now are existing exactly to give the possibility to adapt to the situation, a strict rule, we will, infu we will fuel more and more the sentiment that some, uh, uh, just some countries has to deal with and not the union as a, as a whole. And uh, second, uh, uh, about sending migrant, migrants with uh, um, an enforcement. Uh, this is, uh, I, for me, this is still uh, about the rules of a community. Uh, I cannot accept that we, when, when we are speaking about monetary union and we are speaking about budget and finance, if somebody is not respecting a rule, there is a clear procedure for infringement with the high sanctions and there is not the same when we are speaking about solidarity and a migrant problem that is not just of, uh, with a single responsible, but it's maybe of the responsibility of the whole West, uh, of the poly commercial policy, the foreign policy, which put in place for decades and even for centuries, I could say. Uh, but I also think that um, the sanctions 
could not be just to pay the bill. Uh, to pay the bill uh, with uh, um, an amount for migrant. It's the proposal nowadays of the Commission. They say 250 um, thousand euros per migrant. I would like to ask to all of you, does a life as a cost? Does a life as a cost? We could evaluate the cost of life of a person with 250 thousand euros first, and second, uh, I'm sure that there will be several countries that will be very happy to pay the bill and not having the migrants just for, uh, let's say, political uh, decision, uh, just because I, I must unfortunately recognize many of the leaders inside the European Council are more focused on next elections than on, on next generations. Uh, but this is fooling also uh, the sentiment of uh, racism and that we are seeing even in countries like Germany that uh, were not experienced that since a long time or in which there were some experience but in a very uh, small dimension. So that's why I still think that there are no perfect solutions but maybe the most reasonable one is to stick with the idea to have this preventive compulsory system of, of relocation. Everybody has to fulfill is duty, and I think that the um, sanctions of the structural funds, it will be not just the most effective one for his amount, but more, moreover uh, for a pedag pedagogic uh, purpose, because we'll teach, that will teach so some countries that being a community is also being together, not just in the good times, but in the hard times as well. Mm. Thank you very much.